Good evening and welcome to the first Voyage of Musical Discovery of 2019, presented by the Australian Romantic and Classical Orchestra, and this evening under the direction of my fellow co-artistic director, Rachel Beasley. My name is Nicole Van Bruggen, and tonight we are really pleased to be continuing with our education program, which was created by our founding artistic director, the incomparable musician and music educator, the late Richard Gill. Tonight, we will present music and explanations about concepts of phrasing and form in music. And we're going to address these topics with three musical examples from our orchestra. In addition to the overture, which you've just heard, we will listen to two vocal duets from Mozart's comic opera, The Marriage of Figaro. The famous opening passage of The Marriage of Figaro is an excellent example of a phrase where a mo motive is iterated three times. This was a very common compositional technique in the Baroque and the classical periods. A composer would introduce an idea, and then he would repeat this idea, and then, just in case you haven't got it yet, he'd say it again in a different way. Now we get it. Here is Mozart's idea. Shall we sing that? <laughs> then he says it again with a different emphasis. Let's sing it. <laughs> and now he says it for the third time in the extended version. Here we go. <laughs> Great, now we've got the idea. Let's listen to this initial motive as it becomes a full phrase. We can sing it together with the orchestra. Oh, you were better by yourselves, I thought. <laughs> the motive, or the idea, is the smallest particle. It's like the core of a cell. In the same way that a cell grows and splits and multiplies to form a living organism, the motif grows into a phrase, which then combines with other phrases. They're all repeated and developed to build the larger compositional form of the work, or in this case, of the full-scale opera, which consists of scenes and acts. In other words, there are multiple layers of phrasing and form within the work as a whole. In music, we can look at the phrasing and form of different works in different styles and from different times to gain understanding of how they interact. This is really helpful whether you're a listener, a performer, or a composer. The textbooks will often tell you that form on a larger scale needs to be even or symmetrical. This is complete rubbish. Imagine if every building and every house was built to the same plan. Unusual and asymmetrical things are interesting for the two set of people among us. And Mozart knew this better than anyone. Let's hear the opening of the overture again, and this time keep in mind that it's the very first thing the audience will hear when they have sat down to listen to three hours of opera. While you're listening, count how many bars you hear. So the first question is, how many bars are typically in a phrase in the classical period? Four, eight, yep, depends how you look at it really. How many did you count? Seven, very good. One of our young Mannheim symphonists in the front row here, fantastic. There were seven. So as we continue to listen to the overture now, notice how these irregular phrase lengths that Mozart uses play tricks on your ears. Now, keeping the expectations of the audience of the time in mind, do you notice anything else unusual about this opening phrase? Using just the texture of the strings and the bassoons by themselves, Mozart has opened this opera very softly in pianissimo, which would have surprised an audience of the day. They were sitting there chatting in their seats, waiting for the big crashing opening chords of the opera to start. To signal the work's beginning, these sneaky little phrases would have sounded really unusual for the musical fashion of the 18th century. Mozart does this because he wants to get their attention. And to set up the surprise fortissimo, which is about to come in the tutti passage where everyone plays together. You may 
be familiar with sonata form in music. Sonata form is a really common form used in the classical period. It consists of an exposition which introduces or exposes the main themes. There are two themes. These are also known as the first and the second subject in the exposition. You've already heard the first subject. Let's check the second subject. Following the exposition in sonata form, you have the development section. Then, recapitulation, where the composer restates these main themes, and it finishes with a coda, which is like a kind of conclusion. In this overture, however, Mozart doesn't stick with the standard sonata form. He uses a shortened, or what they call an abridged sonata form, in which he doesn't write an obvious development. Instead, he introduces a brand new theme in the coda, This abridged sonata form breaks all of the established rules of the day. Why does Mozart do that? Maybe he was a rebel, maybe he ran out of time, maybe he just wanted to get on with the opera. He certainly had a really deep understanding of form, and the rebel in him knew exactly what he was doing. Mozart broke rules intentionally in this overture to hint at the confusion of mistaken identities, deceit, and topsy-turvy politics which are about to unfold in the story of the hilarious opera. The reason I wanted to highlight this this evening, as I mentioned before about the unusual and asymmetrical houses, was so that when you're working on your own compositions, you'll know that it's crucial to understand the rules and the conventions before you choose to bend and break them. This probably relates to all parts of life, but don't tell your parents I said that. I don't really have time tonight to go into the whole story of The Marriage of Figaro, but if you like a bit of melodrama with political intrigue, love and lust, and of course humour, then I highly recommend you check out this opera. It's one of the great ones. The subject matter in the opera would have ruffled a few feathers in its day. Written around the time of the French Revolution, 1780s, 1790s, when the people were getting really fed up by being maltreated by their rulers. The opera makes fun, all the way through, of the upper classes, many of whom, of course, would have been in the audience at the time. All of this is embedded in the music, and in particular, in the phrasing and the form. Let's hear the overture in its entirety once more, with all of these ideas in mind.
hope you could hear the abridged sonata form. Now the curtain rises and we see Figaro measuring out dimensions of an empty room. Susanna is admiring her hat. The musical phrases that each character sings, let's call them the measuring phrase and the hat phrase, are quite different and Mozart puts them together in unexpected ways. If you're thinking of composing for two voices, you have a number of options. You can write for two voices in call and response, otherwise known as antecedent consequent. You can contrast each voice with their own distinct phrases, like Mozart does here. Or you can have them sing the same melody with different lyrics, as they do later in this duet, or simply completely contrasting melodies, which occur at the same time. These different combinations of phrases for the two voices give more complexity and allow for more scope in the composition. The fact that Figaro is measuring and Susanna is talking about the wedding hat she has made herself tell us important things about the characters. We learn that they are servants or employees, and secondly, we learn that they are about to be married. To perform and demonstrate these roles in the duettino Cinque Dieci Eventi from Act One, Scene One of the opera, I would like to invite our two soloists to the stage. Please welcome soprano Jacqueline Porter and baritone David Greco. language they were singing. Italiano. Si. The language in which you sing helps determine how the music is phrased. 
Italian is a great language to compose in this respect. It has inbuilt rhythmic devices and consonant and vowel sounds which all influence the pacing and the accents in the music. And which nationality is Mozart? Austrian. Oh, I thought someone was going to say German. I'm impressed. Austrian, yes. With the marriage of Figaro, we have an Austrian composer writing an opera in Italian based on a French play which is set in Spain. Can't get more cosmopolitan than that. Now, getting back on track to Figaro's measuring phrase, let's hear just the violins play the measuring phrase by themselves. join the strings with his measuring phrase. Cinque, dieci, venti, trenta, trenta sei, quaranta tre. In the meantime, Susanna has entered the room. Now, let's see what happens when Figaro is distracted by his beautiful bride-to-be. You'll notice that Mozart delays or displaces Figaro's text compared to the first version, which upsets the phrasing. The phrases don't quite land where you're expecting them to. Cinque. So did you notice the slightly lopsided phrasing this time? It's Mozart's way of telling us that Figaro is not quite concentrating. Sorry, Dave. Now we're going to move on to Susanna's hat phrase, where she's singing about how she loves the hat she has made for her own wedding day. Mozart uses longer, more lyrical phrases now to reflect her character and her emotions. Mozart finds a way to put the different characters' phrases together in a brilliant way. He juxtaposes the measuring phrase with the hat phrase to show us that the two characters are not really paying attention to each other. It's like when you're both sitting, when you're sitting with someone and both people have their heads in their devices. It's a bit like that. Have a listen to how Mozart does this. <laughs> in this scene is further enforced by the motives which the orchestra plays. It's as if a whole lot of different characters are sticking their heads out of hidden doorways. Have a listen to a couple of these brand new ideas he introduces. And then there's another character. I'd like to ask the orchestra now to play the whole duet again with the soloists so we can hear how the phrases are combined and how they overlap and interact to result in the form of this delightful duet. Listen out for the excellent examples of call and response phrases as Figaro finally starts listening to his beloved fiance. <laughs> Thank you. 
which we're going to take a look at, is the recitative from Act 3, Scene 2, called Es Susanna. A recitative in an opera is more like an actual dialogue. It's sparsely accompanied for practical reasons, so that the singers can be more free, like in speech. It moves the story forward, and it tells us what's actually happening plot-wise. There's no typical form to a recitative. It has a free rhythm, and the phrases or the musical interjections are designed purely to, dis to support the words. In this recitative, we witness a conversation between the Count and Susanna. And by all means, please do follow the lyrics in your program books. I can see some of you are already doing that. <laughs> Chissà che l'ha tradito abbia il segreto mio, o se parlato gli fo sposar la vecchia. Marcellina, signore! Cosa bramate? Mi pare che siete in collera. Volete qualche cosa? Signore, la vostra sposa è sole di vapori ed chiede il fiaschetto degli odori. Prendete. E no, potete ritenerlo per voi. <laughs> per me, questi non sono mani da donne trivoli. Un amante che per il caro sposo sul punto d'ottenello. Guardiamo Marcellino con la donna che voi mi prometeste. Io vi promisi. <laughs> Quando? Crede ad aver offeso. Sì. Se voluto il vestito e il tendere me, voi stessa. E il mio dovere è quel di sua eccellenza. Lorenzo da Ponte is the author of the Marriage of Figaro libretto, which is the fancy word for the lyrics of the opera. He claimed that he and Mozart had created a new form of music drama. He wrote this. 
In spite of every effort to be brief, the opera will not be one of the shortest to have appeared on our stage, for which we hope sufficient excuse will be found in the variety of threads from which the action of this play is woven, the vastness and grandeur of the same, the multiplicity of the musical numbers that had to be made in order not to leave the actors too long unemployed, to diminish the vexation and monotony of the long recitatives, and to express with varied colours the various emotions that occur, but above all, in our desire to offer, as it were, a new kind of spectacle to a public of so refined a taste and understanding. They were clearly aware that they were about to present something groundbreaking and were hoping that it would go down well, apparently. So on to the duet, Crudel Perché Finora, which follows the recitative. The plot is thickening now. The Count insists on meeting Susanna in the garden, and to outsmart the Count and the other characters have hatched a plan that the Count's wife, the Countess, will go instead, but she'll be disguised as Susanna. Got it? Got to watch the opera. The Count is setting up this meeting with Susanna. Again, you can follow these lyrics in your program book. And Mozart suggests all of this in the phrasing and the orchestration of the music. These phrasing and form concepts, which we're discussing this evening, are closely interwoven with so many other facets of composition. For those of you who were here last year, when Richard was discussing texture and timbre, you'll remember that he talked a lot about the phrases. Now we're going to hear how the various layers of phrases or motives are built up to create the final texture. Let's first listen to the structure Mozart sets up in the orchestra, displaying the Count's authority with repeated rhythms in the strings. Simultaneously, he writes rising arpeggios and falling scales in the violins. First violin. Mozart gives the winds at the same time sustained chords. Directly following these three layers of music, there's a swaying of the strings and a chromatic unease in the winds. Notice how this unease makes you feel. combine all these phrases and layers now with the Count and with Susanna. Now we've identified the various phrases and the layers. It's surprising how well we'll be able to discern these ideas, even though they're all taking place at the same time. listening to the drama of the whole duet now. Notice the way the singers and the orchestra give us an insight into an otherwise concealed world of conflicting thoughts and feelings of these complicated characters. Phrasing and form are the building blocks of these classical musical structures, which Mozart manipulated, disguised, and developed to create the marriage of Figaro. <laughs> Per 